All right, everyone, this is Professor Rako again here, and uh, today we are going to continue on with leases, and now we're talking about adding in residual values to our problem and kind of how we uh, how it's going to change mainly the front end of our uh, problem and then uh, the very last journal entry uh, if we do the problem all the way through. All right, so first of all, it's important to remember here, the lessor always includes a residual value in the calculations regardless of whether it's guaranteed or not right so remember once again to the lessor they're the one estimating what the residual value is so that's their estimate that's what they expect to happen so they don't care whether the lessee is guaranteeing it or not it doesn't matter to them they they expect to recover whatever the residual value is right so assume the same data from the example we've been using throughout so once again if you're just looking at this video it might be helpful to go back and look at the second and third videos where we introduce all this uh, information but except that now we're going to have a residual value of seventy-five thousand at the end of the lease term all right notice it does not say whether it's guaranteed or not because once again we're just talking about the lessor all right remember they still want to earn a 10 percent return all right, so therefore we are going to calculate the lease payment. All right, so remember the lessor always calculates the payment. All right, so the present value of the asset they're giving up is two fifty one ninety two. Now, once again, these numbers come from the prior videos where we we've already done these. All right, the future value is seventy five. All right, meaning they expect to get an asset back for seventy five at the very end of the lease. So that's a future value. It's still a five year lease term. Their implicit rate is ten. So we compute the payment and it's 48,832. Now, if you go back and look at the prior videos, the only thing different, and I'll just write it over here to the side, this is when there was no residual value. All right, so that would be zero. That's the big difference there. This is still five and this is 10. Our payment in all the previous examples was 60,000. Okay, in the second and third videos, all right? So you can see the difference. So they're able to recover less here in the, from the payments because they're going to be recover some of it through the residual value at the end of the lease. Meaning, in addition to getting this $48,832, they're also getting $75,000 asset back at the end. Okay, that's their estimate. That's their calculation. So the $48,832 plus this $75 at the end allows them to earn their 10% over the life of the uh, lease. All right, now look, if you are not using a financial calculator, uh, this gets a little bit more difficult, all right, but your book outlines how to calculate the payment. All right, so what we're doing here is we're going to focus on the present value of the residual value of 75000 All right, so I'm going to write this out so you've got it, an example of this. All right, so 75000 times the present value of one factor, all right, so that's the table I'm going to. Uh, that would be 0 0.62092. So I'm going to that present value of a dollar table at the intersection of five periods and 10%. And that gives me 46,569. All right, so that means I can, that means we're going to recover through the residual value 46,569 of it. All right, I want 25192 to be recovered in total at 10%. So if I'm recovering 46,569 of it through the residual value, that means I need to recover 203,623 through the payments. All right, so take 203,623 and divide it by the present value of an annuity due factor. So I'm doing the annuity ta due table because I'm trying to figure out the payment. 4.16987. So that's going to equal 48,832. Okay, so there's my calculation of the payment. You can see that's much more involved. That's why I always encourage students have a financial calculator it makes your life so much easier especially on something like this but make sure you understand this logic and what's going on your book outlines this both books outline how to do this as well I believe all right so from the lessee standpoint all right so remember up here lessor includes it regardless okay so it doesn't matter all right for the lessee we only include so this is the lessee we only care if it's guaranteed OK, if it is unguaranteed, it is the same as no residual value, meaning we don't care. We don't acknowledge it doesn't matter what it is. It might as well be zero. OK, so therefore we do not calculate into lease payments. All right. So if it is guaranteed, then we need to figure out whether we're going to use it or not. OK, so we'll just read through these together. If it is probable that the expected residual value is equal to or greater than the guarantee residual value, meaning the list. So in this example, the residual value is 75. 
If we expect it to be 75 or more, the lessee does nothing. Okay, should not include the guaranteed residual value in the computation of the lease liability because we're not expecting to have to make up any difference. I mean, if we're guaranteeing 75 and we expect it to be worth 75 or more, then we're not going to have to pay any money to make up the difference at the end. Okay, so then it will look just like the finance lease problem worked earlier in the notes for the lessee. Okay, so there would be no difference. All right, here's kind of the important one, right? If it's probable that the expected residual value is less than the guaranteed residual value, the difference between the expected and guaranteed residual value should be included in the computation of the lease liability, and it will be the future value at the end of the lease when we do our calculations in the next video. Okay, so it's treated as additional lease payment at the end of the lease term. It's included in the amortization table as an additional row at the end of the lease. All right, so that's just walking us through how we handle it. The next video I'm going to do is going to be a uh, lessee example where we have a guaranteed residual value. and We'll see how that affects our table and our uh, journal entries and whatnot because our payment, remember, is now different. It's now going to be that 48832 that the lessor uh, has told us what the pain that that's what the payment will be. All right. So this is kind of, uh, you know, really just the main point of this is how do we calculate the payment and why is it different? OK, it's because the lessor always includes it, whether it's guaranteed or not. And then down here, it's like, when do we include it for the lessee? Only when the expected residual value is going to be less than what we're guaranteed. OK, so make sure you're clear on that and then tune into the next video as we walk through an example and put this into practice. All right. So I hope you're enjoying it. Tune in next time because we'll walk through a, a longer example.